Welcome everybody here to the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, the Graduate Center CUNY. My name is Frank Henschke. I'm the director of the Siegel Center. And thank you for coming out in the late December and uh, on a cold uh, winter day. Normally we don't do programs anymore. The semester has already ended, the students are home, but it was the only day we could do it uh, um, on December um, 11. And it's an important evening, an important continuation of our um, Italian uh, American Playwrights Project. And I've been uh, involved with it for many, many years together with my great colleague, producer Valeria, who is also with us here. If you look in the program, or on the QXR code, you will find a lot of information. And it's an important evening because we are continuing our uh, involvement. It's the fourth edition. We welcome Graziano Graziano, who came here from Rome. He flew, he was, you were on the airplane this morning still? Yeah. <laughs> and he came with Giuseppina, also a writer uh, uh, of about theater and performance in Italy. So really welcome. Thank you for coming. This shows you how significant this evening is of this uh, great writer who we lost, Torre. And uh, we'd like to welcome also the agent and the agency who represents them here in America. So welcome um, very much uh, here. And uh, the translator, Anthony, who will also give a little, a little introduction to each of what we're going to hear, six pieces. We're going to read the first th two, three, four pages the most. So we get a little insight, but we will have a little introduction to it. He will make some remarks on the translations once we sit down here um, on the panel afterwards. And we have a little time for Q&A. And then um, afterwards, we have a little bit of wine and Valeria graciously uh, brought some panettone. Is that right? Is that true? <laughs> this is what the word on the street is. <laughs> so you will be rewarded uh, for coming out. Um, we, all need, we all need great theater, as we know, um, but also we need great audiences. We need people like you taking the time. And I would like to welcome our national audience. We are on howlround.com. A lot of viewers are now online because uh, during the time of Corona, we did over 200 programmings online. So a lot of people follow us online um, right now and often do not come, especially in such a busy time. And everybody who lives in New York knows how busy this time is right now, everywhere in the world, but especially now. So um, <coughs> again, welcome everybody, the Italian Cultural Institute for their support um, of this evening. We are media partner, Rai Tre, 365 uh, in Rome, a production company, Valeria also is involved. So it is um, really a, a great, great honor to have an evening about uh, someone who we lost, a great writer, a thinker for the theater, and um, who touched on something that moved people and was meaningful and important. And their voices from another place, from another country, some say it's almost like from a distant star when you're in America, but we are a place here at the Siegel, we bridge academia and professional theater, international and American theater. And we want to be there for those voices, to be a host, present them and give them the very best uh, possibility to really be heard. So um, I hand it over uh, to Valeria and you guys come over here, come in front, come closer if you want, you know, here. So we have a circle, we are big believers in circles. Mm -hmm. um, and that is important. Everything should be done in a circle if possible. So um, Valeria, thank you. Well, thank you, everybody, to be here. Uh, after the Corona time, we had a very tough uh, third edition of this project. So uh, I moved to be in person again. This is the first time we are again in person for, uh, with this project. And uh, we decided with uh, Frank uh, to dedicate our fourth edition uh, to just one uh, uh, author that, uh, in my opinion, is uh, one of the greatest uh, in Italy and a uh, late author that uh, he left uh, so soon. And uh, he didn't wrote a lot for theater, but he wrote for television and uh, movies. And, uh, but we will introdu uh, introduct him, uh, uh, introduct him uh, during the panel. So I just want to acknowledge everybody, friends, uh, actors, uh, and uh, director Stella and uh, Anthony, first of all, and Julia, that she came from Italy too, uh, from, uh, um, from Rome to stay with us and support us. So thank you very much. And uh, that's it. So enjoy the evening and uh, let's talk later during the panel. <laughs> Bye. Um. <clears throat> 
Hello. The first monologue is Perfetta, Perfect Lady. A woman talking about the experience of traffic in the city, an almost hallucinatory vision of the chaos of the streets. She's talking at four various points of the month, where tonight we'll only be listening to the beginning, um, reflecting different points in her menstrual cycle with all the psychic aspects that go along with that fact. The city is a wave of chaos. And I'm pure chaos right alongside with the rest. Hordes of tourists flooding the sidewalks of the city center, trooping along after tour guides, waving colorful little banners. Each troop of tourists has their own color, stumbling forward like robots, slamming into things, doing their best not to glimpse their own deep and abiding desire to turn around and go home, back to their own communities, where people love each other, so different from us. I need to keep from crying. Please let me not cry. Hope I don't start. I can sense their well-founded fears of being poisoned, robbed, murdered, their eyes wide in alarm of, and wary vigilance, cortisol pumping through their veins, melatonin level zeroed out. Not until they're safely aboard the flight home will they be able to decompress as they exchange looks of mute emotional solidarity, their eyes welling over with tears and meaningful glances. We made it, we're going home, like Vietnam vets flying back aboard those noisy cargo aircrafts. <laughs> these plain trees, the plain trees of Rome, these boulevards lined with row upon row of magnificent plain trees, and no one seems to know that by their nature, a plane tree cannot stand the presence of another plane tree beside it. <laughs> Never once in the great outdoors will you see a straight line of plane trees because the plane is one of the very few trees in nature that simply cannot abide having a fellow plane tree beside it. <laughs> a plane is a solitary tree, but somebody somewhere simply decided to line up 10,000 plane trees, all <laughs> bewildered and lost, plane trees crying out in anguish, and now I have to keep myself from crying. <laughs> and the traffic, the sheer hatred that traffic knows how to unleash, a hatred that spins around like the great circle of life. Because if I'm driving a car, then I hate scooters. I abhor bicycles, and I'm ready to slaughter all the pedestrians one by one. If I'm riding a scooter, then I fear cars and I'm impatient with cyclists and old people who creep slowly along the sidewalk. Whereas if I'm on foot, I'd be willing to carry a pump action shotgun and shoot everyone I see without distinction, checking each body to make sure they're really goners and not just playing possum like you see those murder headlines, he survived by playing dead. <laughs> and now I need to hold firm and not cry. Then, the pedestrian who cuts right in front of me, damn idiot, but he turns out to be my son, my eldest. <laughs> Ricardo, wait, what are you doing out here? You're supposed to be at school. While the car behind me honks furiously, you asshole, why the fuck are you honking at me? What does everybody want from me? I won't start crying. I must not cry. And then all these thoughts exploding in my brain, the annual boiler inspection, the letter that needs to be sent to our condominium's administrative office, the test for celiac disease that my younger son Julio needs to take. Why my iPad screen no longer seems to have the rotate feature I like so much. All those useless things I never even knew I wanted, but now I can't do without them. At this point, if I'm holding an iPad and the screen won't rotate, it'll ruin my whole day. And I'll be <laughs> right there about to burst into tears. And the one thing I must do is not start crying. All things considered, this traffic is also a vast movement of powerful energy. Hardworking people who go to their offices day after day or pick up their children or run errands of all kinds struggling to remain, if not happy, then at least alive. <laughs> well, it's a movement, movement of people who are holding out, keeping on, and I'm just like all of them. That's what I need to tell myself. I'm a part of the whole. 
not entirely alone and completely misunderstood the way I actually feel. And they're not all out to get me the way it feels right now. Who the fuck are you honking at? <laughs> I'm with them. I'm part of them. And I must not cry. I must not cry because I have work to do. Because this month I have an important objective. And because I have to work hard on my piece and I know I can do it. And when I think this way, I feel such a wave of self-pity wash over me and that my eyes start to fill with tears. My husband calls to ask me something that he suddenly can't remember. And he hears my labored breathing and asks, what's wrong? What's come over you? And I say, nothing. And he asks me, are you having a period? Mm -hmm. oh! <laughs> what are you saying? And he responds in sheer terror, telling me to stay calm, that everything's okay. And he says it in the tone of an FBI hostage no negotiator <laughs> holding a megaphone as he tries to reason with a madman in an A-shirt, you know, wife beater, holding 10 people hostage in a hardware store. After a minute or two, while I can't even remember what I just screamed at my husband, I look around and everything's in slow motion, all liquid, and my head is ringing with those advertising slogans directed at women. All the messages that marketers aim at women to get them to buy perfume or a piece of jewelry or a dress. You are special. Do things your way. Think like a queen. What more do you need? You're beautiful just the way you are. You're the one, live your life in style. It's not just a choice, it's your choice. <laughs> I mean, phrases that mean absolutely nothing. Mm. Though they do sound epic and extraordinary, hypnotic words that warm your heart without really saying a thing and that dig a great big invisible hole deep inside you. And now I definitely can't start crying. I mustn't cry. <laughs> I need to get a grip on myself. I have to top it out this month. I've got a major goal to achieve and I need to get it done. Don't cry, you're special. A choice, your choice, but now I'm sobbing. I'm crying like a river. My period started an hour ago. Our second piece is In Mezzo al Mare, I'm at Sea. It's a young man speaking about waiting for a phone call, a call from a young woman he's in love with, a traffic accident he was recently involved in, and for which he's going to be a witness in a court case. He's quite a talker, and his musings range from details of a tennis match to large philosophical observations about life. I was waiting for her to phone me, like always. On the TV, the presenter was announcing a segment on financial astrology. This is an excellent time for Gemini's to invest, she said. <laughs> but that's not what was putting me in a bad mood. Nor was it the cake I was eating, the chocolate cake that had actually come in a fabulous aromatite package. I kept on waiting for her to call. But that wasn't what was ruining my mood, of course not. I, I hadn't heard or seen her in months. Or perhaps we should say that for months I've been hearing her voice and seeing her face everywhere. I've turned. She'd become a, an obsession of mine. I don't know. At home, at the office, on the street, in my rear view mirror, on billboards and bus stops the front pages of newspapers, stray sheets of paper on the sidewalk. I kept seeing Eleanor everywhere. Once I even saw her on the skid mark in the asphalt. It was an easy time. <laughs> I, I, 
was having trouble getting to sleep at night. That is, at, at night, I, 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 I did sleep and I did dream, but my dreams were pointless. I could have dreamt wonderful things like flying or making love with gorgeous women. No such luck. I kept having pointless dreams about going into a cafe and ordering espresso or double parking my car. <laughs> <laughs> One night I even dreamed I was dreaming. <laughs> so endlessly depressing. <laughs> the real reason for my bad mood, though, wasn't that. It was having to testify in court about a car crash that had taken place months before on the Via Aurelia, which involved me in a way. Though uh, all I can recall of that evening are scattered fragments. The Via Aurelia, 3.30 AM, driving home from a wedding. There was an accident, an accident that I, so to speak, witnessed. Now, the accident had happened, no doubt about that. I, I, it was a ser serious accident. Spectacular one. The car right ahead of me had, had been sideswiped by a truck. And that was that. Then the next morning, we lost a major match. We were up against a bunch of kids from Toscania, which is a delightful little city with a delightful little historical center full of despicable young people. <laughs> <laughs> despicable, but tremendous at ping pong. A few friends of mine and I play ping pong, semi-professional level. And then commonly jury pursuit. Anyway, we thought we were going to go in and teach these young kids from Tuscania a lesson that they wouldn't soon forget. Instead, they beat us. Mm -hmm. And then their coach shot us a murderous glare. He weighed a good 225 pounds. Mm -hmm. Men who weigh 225 pounds can really shoot murderous glare. <laughs> and sure enough, our defeat at Tuscania had been a bloody murder. Even so, my lousy mood wasn't caused by the memory of that. It was because of my testimony in court. Because it goes without saying, testifying implies, let's not even say an awareness, but at least a reasonably detailed knowledge of something we're involved in, which is what I find so difficult. I couldn't even tell you who I am. Or really, I, I should say, I know more or less who I am, but what I can't stand is people who know exactly who they are. People who know themselves. They know how to say, this is the way I am. This is how I've become. <laughs> I have this reaction for this reason. <laughs> or just think that other reason is why I behave this way. Is this some sort of mania these days where we know how to describe ourselves so perfectly? We don't know, we can't possibly know. Whatever we may or may not know these days, we, we, we just love being able to describe ourselves. I'm one of those people who, if anyone says this to me, then I, in that case, I'm, I'm a guy who, let me tell you, won't hesitate to say that. <laughs> I've always reacted this, to such and such and just like this thing. Anyone who knows me will tell you. Everyone knows themselves. Everyone knows the way they are. Everyone can tell you the way they're put together. But I can safely say it. Unlike everyone else, I know nothing. <laughs> nothing about else, nothing about people and the things around me. I don't understand a thing, which is a wonderful thing to be able to say. I, it takes a self-respect and a conscience and a genuine courage to say it. People, let me tell you, I really and truly don't understand a fucking thing. <laughs> Gola, gluttony, a slightly older man talking about food in a headlong, almost free-form discussion <coughs> of the Italian way of eating. A strong, almost haranguing philosophical descri description of the nation's relationship with food. <laughs> Italia! <laughs>
Italy is this country you ride through by train and it's full of verdant hillsides and history and river valleys and artistic cities and traditions of all kinds and literature and poetry. But basically what we'd like to do most is eat, manja. <laughs> I mean, for reasons shrouded in the mystery that may have something to do with our memories of war, that war which truly ruined us all. We're now this country that loves to eat, this country filled with vitality and virility that eats when the time comes to eat without even stopping to give it a second thought. A country that quite simply eats more than any other country on earth because <laughs> there's no country on the planet that eats more than we manja. <laughs> We're a country that eats without ifs, ands, or buts. I mean, uh, for real, uh, after the war, maybe to diffuse the drama, just a little bit, we sat down, we started eating away. <laughs> Eat, now that the war is over. Thank you. What are you saying thank you for? Just eat. <laughs> <laughs> and we spent decades now eating all kinds of things. Mm. This is good. It, it tastes funny, but what is it? It's lard. I don't get it. What? It's lard. Eat it. <laughs> it's good. It's rich. Mind you. It's fried bread. Eat it. It's brains. Mind you. It's spleen. Mind you. I don't even know what it is. Eat. Mind you. Mind you. Eat your subpoena because the war might always come back. I mean, there are plenty of other countries that have faced the harsh ordeal of war, but still, this incredible ravenous hunger never came to any of them. No one's ever heard of a country that for decades after the war still had the unbelievable hunger that we all have. I mean, what we think of as the best thing in the world is if after dinner you feel a little bit queasy, then that's the height of pure joy. If you've eaten until you feel ill, then it really means that the war must be miles away. And that's how we like things best for war to be far, far away at a safe distance. I mean, in a sense, you could say that we ward off war with bowls full of a big ziti. That's right. We subconsciously invoke mokumba rituals against war using risottos or porcini mushrooms, mm, sticks of butter. We make these mokumba sacrifices for war to be far, far away at a safe distance. I mean, in a sense, you could say that we ward off war. I said that already. <laughs> I mean, we have this, let's call it uh, gastronomic pacifism. <laughs> We're pacifists with our mouths full. With high points of pacifism that truly verge on universal harm, we say, when we vomit. <laughs> and that's when we're in sync with the constellations. At one with the cosmos is what we are when we throw up, say, uh, Turbo and potatoes. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, after all, for us pure and simple, the worst thing about war even, even isn't so much the dying or the bombs falling and devastating bridges and apartment buildings. When war comes, the real problem is there's very little to eat. And what little there is, is awful. For example, you find yourself eating raw potatoes. And raw potatoes are disgusting to us. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to eat potatoes, you should have the most of it with rosemary. <laughs> but the real point is, is that we like potatoes as a side dish. We need to accompany something else. And that's something else that has to be made food, not war. Something substantial you could tuck into. So what do we do? Really, it's not so much we turn our back on war, even as we reproduce it at the dinner table, stuffing our faces until, so to speak, uh, we're packed as full as a cake, until that packed cake feeling accompanies us in the moments we consider to be most important in our lives. Christmas, New Year's, Easter, weddings, 
and in those important circumstances, we're happiest if we're really on the brink of vomiting. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong? Do you feel bad? No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm as happy as, as I can be. But you look a little bit of green under the gills, huh? No, no, exactly. I'm overjoyed. <laughs> Migliore, better. A young man in his 30s who works as an engineer for an American company that demands absurd services from him, all depending on customers' whims. He's got to put up with these crazy situations and maintain a firm, unshaken belief in the logic of the company's <laughs> That was the one day he was given a sort of neutral chance to kind of taste it just as the reason that he wanted to take it. He got a problem. Now the workshop seemed worthwhile. Taste it. Before you know it, just a year. Analysis and recovery are great with the test. Even so, two, three minutes and the rotation was consistent. That total deficit. To achieve the head count of 10 individuals so they could bring this new product to life. There were nine of them. They needed just one more. And that one individual, Alfredo, they, there have to be 10 of us. Otherwise, Senora Inga can't sell the expenses. But hey, guys, we just finished our workshop on the Duomo Bread in the good old days. Alfredo, what on earth has gotten into you? This was a pretty delicate crossroads in my life. As a company, as I work, my job was at risk. A modern American company, one of those. Corporations that tried to work its way into your head. It was expected to control you to be ethical and, and trustworthy. Ethical and trustworthy on the job, but also to be nothing less than exemplary citizens. Kind and generous, and a company that, that loves you, and a company that mm -hmm. wants you to be better. Your best self. After my service at your morning, Mr. Alfredo speaking. This is Baraldi speaking. I want a table for two at the Hilton, and on that table, I want a bouquet of 51 red roses at 9 o'clock sharp. Oh, and I'm in Bangkok. <laughs> <laughs> You need to be spending at very high levels. And, and people who have very high levels of spending might not even say good morning or good afternoon. They're in a hurry. They want their double back. This is Dr. Canandele. I want a Porsche. I want it today. And I want a yellow. <laughs> <laughs> That Porsche. I don't want it yellow anymore. My wife doesn't like yellow. She wants it black. Darling, are you sure about this? <laughs> yes, black. <laughs> the Porsche. I don't want a Porsche anymore. And I want the BMW. That's right. I don't want that license plate ending in an even number. That's important. Even other sections are in place downtown. There was a 
time when there were 99 of us operating. That's, that's the American term, operating. But now the company was about to introduce that computerized system that then required 20 of us. Eight feet smart, enthusiastic young people, plus Mario Kalicia and me. All of us on the second floor, the lowest rung in our career. Mario Kalicia, he was a he's a good person. He had a bad case of conjunctivitis and lived so far away that he could hardly even know where it was. But at the end of each workday, he would get into his car and drive off, heading south. Every time he started his engine, he would shut his eyes and say, okay, let's cross our fingers. Let's hope I find a new way home. <laughs> his work meant everything to him, as did it to me. I'll be back to you with confirmation in eight minutes. I'll be back to you with uh, confirmation in 60 minutes. Oh, yes, uh, I'll be back to you with confirmation in, 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 in 40 minutes. I enjoyed the work. Yeah, so did Felicia. I mean, both of our positions were at risk, and they didn't make a mystery about the fact that one Tuesday, an email came down from Fifth Floor <coughs> that said, fairly informal one, <coughs> your jobs are at risk. By year's end, one of the two of you will be out. But that didn't take me and Felicia and each other by the leash. If anything, it was the uh, the opposite. We kept milking each other's morale. Go, Mario. Go, 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 go. <laughs> Hello, this is for Randy. I need a flower lay from away. A real one, okay? <laughs> I lost a bet with a colleague. Delivery in Varese, outside Milan. The day after tomorrow, between 9 and 11 in the morning, because after that, I'm holding my regular seminar on Kierkegaard. <laughs> That's my job. Stand back to my company. So, and the only way we got is this uh, company bag, as the Americans call it. There's this uh, little magnetic card that knows everything about me. Every Friday morning, there's uh, this, this fire drill. Oh. And we had this rehearsal evacuation of the building. Do a good job. There are some uh, some prize vacations to place around the world. Oh, at especially high risk with uh, terrorism. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone anxiously awaits the most challenging ordeal of the year. The annual meeting <laughs> with the president. You meet him in his office, and you're expected to perform just one thing you know how to do. One thing and anything at all. Anything at all. Explain how you do it, and we need help. He watches you, and he says, you're going to do it. He makes decisions. The best decisions. The best decision is to make. here and now. Two men, Sampieri and Aliotta, have been involved in a head-on crash between two heavy scooters. The two bikes are practically melded together like a conceptual art piece at the Venice Biennale. Sampieri, the younger of the two, is wearing a shiny blue tracksuit and looks vaguely like a drug dealer. Yeah. Aliotta, older, is dressed like an insurance salesman. They've both got motorcycle helmets wedged on their heads at first. Uh, hello? Uh, Sal, DG, how are you? DG, yeah, look, look I, I've had an accident and, uh, yeah, I guess I had a crash with my scooter. Yep, nope, I, I'm just fine. Uh, I'm on my feet. Don't, <laughs> don't worry. I'll get this taken care of in a flash. After all, I am just right around the corner. Yep, five minutes and I'll be there. I'll be there. Don't, don't, don't worry. Don't worry. Sal. Yeah, yeah. You're great. You're great. Sal. <laughs> Sal. <laughs> Whoa. 
Hello. Yes, is, is 911? Yes, hello. There's been an accident. Uh, I want to report an accident. We could use an ambulance here. Yeah, two scooters. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Two, two, two people involved. I'm fine. Uh, I'm fine. The other guy, he, uh, not, not, not so much. Uh, I think he might be deceased. Uh, I couldn't say. <laughs> yes, uh, Tempieri is the name. Aurelio Tempieri, that's right. Oh, what road this is this? Look, I'm on the open countryside, all right? Look, yes, I was coming down Casa Verde and headed down the Beltway. It was a detour. Look, I, I got lost. And this guy hit me head on. You get me? Yeah, slammed right into me. Yeah, uh, my cell number is, uh, uh, cell number is uh, 335 uh, uh, 616-120. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, of course, certainly, yeah, I got you. I got you, yeah, 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 that's right, it's, uh, yeah, it's just a second ago. Uh, no, okay, yeah, <coughs> what, what, what should we do now? Uh, we'll, we'll wait, we'll wait, it's, we're sure someone's coming. That's right. You'll, you'll find us, yeah, okay, yes, thank, thank you. Yeah. Oh, BD. Yeah. How you doing? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm great. 15 minutes. Yeah. I, I'll be with you. I, I'm almost done here. Uh, no, no, I, I don't know exactly where I am. But in the meantime, look, I, I called an ambulance just because I don't know. Look, I told you. Hold on a second. Yeah. What's the name of this road? You happen to know? No. No. You mean to tell me you don't know the name of the neighborhood, this place, this road, and you have no idea? No. <laughs> I don't know. It's very important for me to know. I mean, you know, to speed up bureaucracy. Avalanche, no. Follow me? I don't know. <laughs> Wait, are you Italian? Do you understand when I talk to you? I don't know. BG, no, I was just talking to the guy that crashed into me. You understand? Yeah. Yeah, he hit me head on. Just unbelievable. Listen, just get out of here and I'll call you, okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. I got to go now. Ciao. Ciao. <laughs> I don't know what road this is. Because you're wide awake, you're alive, everything's okay. But just keep things under control. Because I'm a little upset at myself. You know, let's just say it, it wouldn't take much more of your nonsense to put me over the edge. <laughs> Let me tell you. What are you shouting about, huh? Why don't you pipe down? Look at the mess you made. Look, huh? How fast were you going? You hit me head on. You hit me head on, Capito. <laughs> I know what a wreck you are. You did it to yourself. Listen to these guys. Listen to these guys. You call them on the phone. They don't pick up. Let me tell you, these volunteers manning the 911 line, they won't even pick up. Volunteer. Conscience is always clean, you know? You understand? Because if they so much lift a finger, they tell you, oh, look at me, I'm just a volunteer. Yeah, they're the real cancer killing this country. Mm. They're old as fuck. These geriatric volunteers <laughs> two plague rolled into one giant monster. The volunteer who works for the 911. They don't even answer. I'm leaving. Not just answering. Huh? <laughs> you never change. 
Oh. Let's get started, all right? <laughs> Us? Who, who, what are you talking hello, about? Hello, 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 911. Hey, hey, yeah, listen, I just called a few minutes ago. Did I talk to you? Mm, yeah, I thought so from your voice, pal. Yeah, you and I must be the same age, bro. Look, I just wanted to know about the, the ambulance. I called for an ambulance on account of a head-on collision. Two scooters crashed out here. What, where are we with that? Sampieri's the name. Aurelio Sampieri. Yes, I already told you. I told your colleague that I don't know where we are. <laughs> Look, I gave him fairly detailed indications. Yeah, yeah, my, my cell phone's the latest model, but why? <laughs> no, it's, it's broken. It's, it's broken. Otherwise, I could have found my location. <laughs> Let's just not act like clueless boomers right now. <laughs> Tell me where we are with the ambulance. The number is 335-616-120. Down your national day. Look, I know, yes, but yeah, thanks. What, what, what's the upshot? Well, what are we supposed to be doing? Let's not waste any more time, okay, pal? Look, I know there's a parade in the city center, and that's where the ambulances are. <laughs> in procession. For what? Okay, okay, perfect. Look, thank, look, thank you. Thank you, okay? <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I, I mean, you, you tell me, pal, what the situation is. <sighs> hey, what you, hey, hey what, do you, what, do you, what do you think you're doing? Hey, stop messing with the helmet. Hold on, calm down. <laughs> don't take, don't take off your helmet. Quattro Cinque Sei, four, five, six. A strange little family, a mother, her grown son, and the father. But as the play begins, the mother is speaking comfortingly, comfortingly to her son in a bizarre dialect invented by Mattia Tolbeck, and even singing him a lullaby. <clears throat> the father returns home distraught over the fact that there's a southwest wind with all the awful things such winds bring with them. The mother has been describing to her son the proper manners involved in eating a dormouse in a restaurant. Um, good manners require nothing be left in the plate but the dormouse's teeth. Quite surreal. Are you nervous? Are you nervous about tomorrow? Why, why, why? It's just normal to be nervous. Genesio, even your father is nervous, very nervous. His nerves are on edge about tomorrow, on edge about the wind. But tomorrow the wind will die down. Everything is going to be fine. Genesio, don't be afraid. Shall I sing you a lullaby the way you like it? Now your mama will sing you a nice lullaby. What's wrong? Are you feeling irascible? Are your nerves on edge? Are you feeling wrathful? Why did you give up smoking, Janae? I know why you did it. You made a vow, didn't you? You made a vow. But making a vow is sacrilegious. Did you know that? <laughs> I'll sing you a lullaby. You want me to? Yes, mother. <laughs> Good boy. A dormouse is small with a chestnut gray color on its back. 
Its face has large eyes and round ears. It has a nice, soft fur. Looks like a squirrel. You like the story of the Dormouse? It's pretty, so pretty. When it emerges from hibernation, the Dormouse is still slightly dazed. Poor little thing, bewildered. It needs to be careful because it's easy prey in the dangerous forest. Just to tell you, just to give you an example, all you have to do is shine a flashlight in its face to disorient it completely. And there you go. Hit it on the head with a rock, stun it, and you can catch it easy. Easy. <laughs> <laughs> The Dormouse is served whole on a dish, cooked in tomato sauce, and placed whole on the serving dish. The smell is very, very strong. And indeed, this is a dish for a strong palate, for a cast iron stomach. When you eat a Dormouse, you have to eat every last bite leaving nothing on the plate but the teeth. Otherwise, you insult the cook. The Dormouse cooked the way mother knows how, nice and crunchy and slightly spicy, is a cure-all for bronchial disease, emphysema, and rheumatism. It wards off the heart attacks. It brings good luck. People say that hunting dormice endangers a protected species. Death to the forest rangers, damn them! Death to the forest rangers! Death to the forest rangers! Death to the forest rangers! There's a libacho, the west wind! <laughs> that can't be Ovidio. Yes, it's a west wind. But Ovidio, maybe you're just got it wrong. Maybe it's just a light wind out of the valley. No, it's here. The Labacho, the damn west wind. Leave the room, Genesio. Get out of here. <laughs> because tomorrow is a very important day. He's feeling irascible. His nerves are on edge. Maria, what on earth have I done wrong? Why? Why does a lamento have to do with it? Why now of all times? You'll see. It'll pass, Ovidio. It'll pass, and that nasty wind will move on. Lamento never did anyone any good. But maybe it'll just last one night. And tomorrow morning, it'll be gone. But you know, you need to shut your trap. So, uh, what's for dinner already decided? Oh, yes, yes, Ovidio. <laughs> Don't get upset. Eh, what a tragedy. I can really feel the tragedy. The tragedy. tragedy. Ovidio, <laughs> everything's going to be perfect. A wonderful day. Mata day, Mata day, Mother of God, Mother of God, yeah, the Mother of God, yeah. <laughs> Ovidio, Ovi, darling, I love you. Tell me what's for dinner, Guglielmino. <laughs> Come on, I love you too. Hmm? Uh, uh, what's for dinner? Yes. What's for dinner? Again? The whole menu. Mm. Tell me everything. Come on. Pasta. Con finocchio. Minestra. Culigambrielli e presutto. Mm. Zuppa e cocotte. Mm. Tanarozzi. Cipodratti. Gente volte me fai lo fascisti fatti dire. Uh. <laughs> oh, vi te prego. E pizza a dormire. Mm. È tutto pronti, è tutto perfetto.
I told you. Told me the whole menu. What's for dinner? No, I just can't. No! That's the Forest Rangers! <laughs> That's to the Forest Rangers! That's to the Forest Rangers! <laughs> In translation, one of the most difficult and deceptive and oft often inadequately solved problems is dialect. A dialect has been called a language without a navy or an army. Um, William Weaver, who translated The Name of the Rose and many other great works of Italian literature. In thinking about this, when he was writing about uh, a book, The Pasticciaccio by Gadda, said, uh, how do you translate Faulkner into Italian? Do the Snopeses become its Sicilian fishermen? Because the way that the Snopes talk is so specific to them and to that place, that county, that to do so is to completely strip it of its specificity. The first line in 1984 is, it was a bright spring morning and the clocks were striking 13, very unsettling. In Italy, the clocks at one o'clock in the afternoon always strike 13, mm -hmm. so that is completely lost, the first line mm -hmm. of that book. There was a show called, let's call the whole thing Gershwin, which for copyright reasons has been abolished. <laughs> and in it, a um, young woman auditioning, one of their songs sings, you say potato, I say potato, you say tomato, I say tomato. What's wrong with this song? <laughs> this is a similar problem to dialect. A great deal of it came through here, but there's something magical about dialect that we can't quite master. So what we've tried to do is set up a sort of Rosetta Stone of different versions of one of the lines from this strange dialect that Mattia Torre invented. So we're going to be going with the original invented dialect, the plain vanilla English, the Italianizing version, the Brooklynizing version, and I think truest mm -hmm. to what Mattia Torre was doing, the hallucinizing version. Now, it's not going to be obvious. We're working this through, but this is our first stab at it. So let's go. Giru, vini servito intero in tuo piatto. Uocina dal sugo e mi sentero in tuo piatto. L'odore è forte, forte, e infatti è un piatto per palati forti, per stomaci forti. When you eat a dormouse, you have to eat every last bite, leaving nothing on your plate but the teeth. Otherwise, you insult the cook. The dormouse cooked the way mother knows how, nice and crunchy and slightly spicy is a cure-all for all bronchial disease, emphysema, and rheumatism. It wards off the heart attacks. It brings good luck. The dorm mouse uh, has, uh, you make a serve a whole entire in the dish, uh, or cook it in a tomato sauce, uh, and you put a whole entire on a serve in a ditch. I smell a very, very strong, and I show this dish for strong palato, cause I want you to cause I own a stomach. Stomach's gotta be so served with a hole on a on a dish, and cooking it in some tomato sauce, and put it on a whole serving dish. Smell it so so strong and. Shoot, this is a dish for the strong breath. 
and the hallucinizing version. Sador Musa says, Sierva, whole entire cocktail and the salsa of tomatique. Put a hole in a serving dish. Dot smell is a so so strong shoe. That's a dish about a strong palata, but a cast iron stomach. Well, this was a, a great presentation. Thank you. This is a really, really great. So let's have a little panel. Whoever wants to join from the actors, come. So Valeria uh, Graziano, um, let's take some of the chairs. Um, the director, um, let's take some of the chairs. Oh, yes. oh, the Stella. Do you want do you want the actors? No. We can be on the side. Be on the side over here. But be some of the joint here too. So we can go. Okay. Let's see. I'll sit down there. Are you joining us? This is perfect here. Yeah. Outside on the right, but it's on the left from the audience, so that's good. Um, so again, I think, first of all, another round of applause for, for the actors and for the director. So... Uh, this was the American premiere, you're right. It has never been read, so you witnessed something great. It's a, a part of theater history now, and thanks to, to the actors, a great, great job. So um, maybe uh, we uh, ask first, uh, Graziano, who came all the way from Rome, you have uh, overlooked uh, Italian theater over decades. Um, where does Matthias Torre, where does he fit in? Who is he and who was he? Wow, what a question. <laughs> so for so I'm I'm really happy to be here in presence again. It sounds so wonderful and incredible to me to uh, be in a place like this, where you can, yeah, right in the center of Manhattan, listen to the words of the playwrights from around the world. And I agree with uh, Valeria before she said that Mattia Torre is one of the best playwrights of our present time in Italy, and I agree with that because it's for sure one of the most intelligent and at the same time most popular playwrights. He grew up uh, in, in Rome, right? Tell us a little bit about his life before he got in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he was born in Rome, and I think that uh, this is significant uh, from, uh, to, to understand his writing because he used... Uh, Rome is a very strange city. It's three million people living there in a total mess. <laughs> I can say about <laughs> bureaucracy <laughs> and uh, uh, this functioning of many, many things. And you can see a lot of vices of uh, our country from Rome. And I think that uh, Mattia Torre take this point of view to, to spread the universal message. But it's so typical from Rome, even the language. And sometimes, of course, for, by the actor that uh, interpreted the, 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 the place, but um, the point of view of this uh, mess is something that uh, go deep inside, uh, you know, the, the, the place and can tell something about our present. But the most important is that uh, uh, this is not a cynical message, but it's a, a way to face the mess and continue going on with the empathy. That is peculiar because. Uh, in Rome, we, you know, we say that our dialect, for example, is uh, a way to be cynical. Maybe you can laugh, but sometimes <laughs> a way to be cynical. cynical. Pierpaolo Basolini, that uh, you know, was used, uh, he, he wasn't not from Rome, but he used uh, the Roman dialect in his book. 
he used to say that uh, the, 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 the word in the Roman dialect that he preferred was ambedi, that uh, means look at that. Because it's the unique moment that the Romans, uh, you know, they start not to be cynical and they are open to, you know, to wonder, you know? Mm. And uh, this is the point of view, to face the mess and uh, continue uh, to get empathy for the relationship between humankind. And uh, uh, Mattia Torre starts his work in the in theater. I mean, if you look at the his page on his page on uh, Wikipedia, you probably would find something like uh, screenwrite. And he did a lot of wonderful television for sure. But he started in theater, and he continued to write for theater. He wrote a lot uh, for theater because. I think he, he finds something in this special language that is theater, that is, you know, uh, somebody that meets some other people on the stage, look at a body and a language becoming something, telling a story. It was something that is related to this idea of not to be cynical, you know, to face the mess and not to be cynical. I remember when I saw the first play, it was uh, at sea. How do you translate? In Mezzo al Mare. Yeah, I'm at, I'm at the sea, yeah, with uh, a wonderful actor, this uh, Valeria Prea, interpreting this play. And uh, it was in a very, very, you know, black box theater in the center of Rome, in Testaccio. And uh, I was surprised because uh, I, I say, this is something new. This is something new because it was so ordinary, I mean, the story, at, at the same time, extraordinary, because we can feel you know, uh, a reading, a deep reading of our present in that words. But at the same time, it was everything, it, it was so ordinary, so, you know, uh, day by day life. And uh, it, it, it sounds uh, some, like something new because in our tradition, theater especially is made it for uh, intellectual. I mean, it's very, it's not always, you know, high, high level writing, <coughs> but, uh, you know, it, it becomes with a, a strong tradition. And uh, television is normally is for, is popular and uh, it use another kind of register that it's, we say it's lower. But uh, what happened in Mattia Torre, uh, you can find the same voice in the television and in the theater. And this is peculiar. Mm -hmm. This is really peculiar because mm -hmm. we have a lot of people coming from television doing wonderful television, but you know, medium theater or in the other side, in the opposite side, you have strong actors or playwrights that do wonderful theater. When they try to get popular, they fail because because they don't find the right voice. Uh, I think that uh, you know the, the, what it's incredible about Mattia Torre work is he keep the same voice in the theater in the television because he find a way to be popular and to give a deep point of view of our present. Yeah, n n normally or very often we see the, the lives of rich people of like succession or the, the royal family in London, millionaires or pop stars, whatever. He, he seemed to be, as you said, normal, ordinary people. How did he communicate? How did he communicate to them? Was he interviewing them? Was he part of them? Was he had like Pasolini, the famous nightlife when he was done, he would go out. How did he do that? that he caught uh, this very special Roman atmosphere? I think that is the point of view he had on the reality. I mean, he is a stronger ob observer and uh, he find the, 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 the right way to, you know, to understand where it's possible to, uh, you know, to break the, 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 you know, the, the, the reality we have in front and to see inside the reality. For example, the most famous um, TV series in, uh, that he wrote with two colleagues, uh, Luca Vendruscolo and uh, Giacomo Ciarrapico, that is called Boris, is a, a TV series that uh, tell about a TV series. So he can say, he can tell the story of how mad is uh, the, the, you know, the, the show business in Italy. Not, not only because, uh, I mean, who <laughs> people that work in television are a little bit mad every every in every part of the world, but even because all the vices of our society become the double or maybe ten size in there, and they find a way to tell you know just 
telling the story of a, a group of actors that working on, a, on you know, for a very bad uh, uh, TV series about, you know, uh, feelings, yeah, like a soap opera, like a soap opera. What's extraordinary that uh, doing this work, uh, Mattia Torre invented a language like uh, not not so radical as we saw in the last uh, <coughs> piece, what I think to say, four, five, six, but he invented the language. I mean, there's some expression coming from that uh, TV series that we still use in our common language right now. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. Incredible, yeah. Stella, you are a director, you're also an actor, you're deeply involved also in film. You came on also the last moment because we had some changes. How was that for you? What do you think of the work? Um, so I'm from Rome and it was very hard to uh, try to deliver uh, the message to American actors um, of what those words meant. Because as a, a Roman myself, and as uh, he said too, um, it's hard to take the Roman um, personality out of the contest and try to deliver it to someone that is not um, used to live that type of life. So for example, when I was trying with uh, Stephen, uh, I told him uh, the 2nd of June, and he didn't get at the beginning what he meant. And <laughs> I was like, yeah, because it's, you know, it's a national holiday. I was like, yeah, so what? <laughs> Rome is not like uh, New York, where everything keeps functioning and working. <laughs> so like the 2nd of June, yes, like if you get hit in the road, you can, you might stay there for a long time. <laughs> the ambulances are, are busy somewhere else. And and I think that even Anthony had. Uh, I mean, we we talked a lot about this. It's it's very hard for uh, the translating part as well. Um, left alone the, uh, the four, five, six, where there is a, a dialect that a dialect that is invented. But uh, yeah, the Romanity is like I don't know translating uh, a piece of soul, you know. So it it was it was hard. And it was a reading too, so we couldn't use too much the bodies and objects, uh, but they did great and we did it in so short time. And I'm grateful for the opportunity, it was, uh, it was amazing. So yeah, but something was, was shining through, uh, since she's talked about the actors. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us, wh how was it for you? Well, <clears throat> I'm first generation and I'm from, uh, uh, I grew up speaking, uh, Southern Italian dialect. So one of the things I wanted to say is that while you can say, ooh, this strange dialect, the truth is that whether you're talking about a dialect from Bari or a dialect from Basilicata or from Sicily or from Rome, wherever that dialect is from, the dialects, because they're coming from a kind of poverty, they're coming from a very similar emotional point of view you know I don't you know what I mean like when I read these I'm just looking at this and going well okay it's it's not Lucano which is what I speak but it, it must be it could be it could be Sicilian you know what I mean so I just feel that um I mean for me it's exciting because I live in America and America is very uninvolved with the rest of the world so we don't we don't really see we don't see you know one of the most and I think Frank you've been dedicated to this for years we don't see a lot of foreign theater in America you can go to Italy and you can go all over the place and you can see tons of American theater in other places but we don't really see that much foreign theater here so it, it was very exciting and also that Matteo Torre is new to me. I don't know him until Valeria asked me to participate. And listening to all of the monologues, which were done so well by all the actors, <clears throat> I, I just thought it was so, um, he was so contemporary. You know, there was, there was a contemporariness to the, to the messages. You know, and I, I thought that that was really phenomenal. It makes me want to read a lot more of his work. Yeah, yeah, thank you. This also is, it is Penny Arcade, a legendary performer yeah. here in New York from everybody who knows the, the, 
the uh, playwright and playwright, playwright yeah. performer, <laughs> filmmaker, video maker. But um, yeah, maybe um, before we come to the translator, but uh, to any one of the actors, how how was that for you? I think we are a place we also listen, you know, to the artist. The place. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, th I thought it was uh, I thought it was very interesting. I am uh, I'm new to Mattia uh, Torre as well, but I thought the piece, the particular piece that I did, I was talking to Stella about it, and uh, I, I the, the language, even though it was new to me, it felt very familiar. You know, mm -hmm. it felt like a Woody Allen mm -hmm. monologue, and like you know, it was it was kind of that. And and it was just embodying that, you know, um, who this I could tell what type of person this was, just based off the situations and the language of it, um, and hearing you know the different monologues, um, you get a sense of what it's like to be Roman. You get a sense of what it's like to be Italian. Um, yeah, so I th I thought it was, I thought it was very interesting. I don't know what else. So, for me, I already knew uh, Mattia Torre from Boris, the, the Italian series. So, for me, uh, found him here in America, in New York, was like a beautiful thing, uh, magical. So, the, the only thing that I want to say is that I'm happy to be here performing at the Seagull Theater here, um, performing uh, a thing that is an Italian type. So... All the mix of the culture, all the mix of the magic of the theater, of the cinema is, for me, is marvelous. So I'm at peace. <laughs> well, um, Golo, gluttony, um, I think has a universal message. And, and growing up, I was talking to Penny about it, the, the dishes that my family, when they weren't doing too well, I remember them getting um, property in Long Island, uh, uh, in Brooklyn. The, uh, the government gave uh, Grumman Air Force Base. That property was owned by the government, and they uh, they didn't care if Italians uh, got a little plot of land and they, and they would grow tomatoes and basil, and they would come to Brooklyn and sell it. And and my, I still remember my aunt Chelsea. They had an interview with the in the paper and she said that, yeah, we sell, because they were talking about this plot of land and how people from Brooklyn come and they, and they, and she said that in the paper that, yeah, whatever we don't, whatever we don't sell, we eat, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and it, it came from this, 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 this seed of being hungry. And I think that moves into a, a consciousness now that we're all so health minded and, uh, and and um, dietarily, you know, diet the diets and stuff like that, and we work out and stuff. So it it really rings true that past of of war and how little they had and basta badan and basta vazu, everything with pasta, pizza, macaroni and stuff. So it was really a very very great uh, universal experience for me, at least as the act. I can really empathize and relate to it. Um, don't you think that? You know, <clears throat> New York is a very Italian city. I mean, you know that, right? Huh? No, yeah. no. <laughs> right, if you're Italian, it's more Italian. But if you, I mean, New York is a Jewish city and it's an, and it's an Italian city. Energistically, it's Italian. And I think that in those monologues, like the monologue Keisha did, and the monologue Skyler did, and the monologue Stephen did, there is a very much a similarity of a vibe to it, you know? I mean, okay, New York is probably more a Napolitan than it is Roman, you know? But there's still something very, very close to the bone there where I think any of those monologues like that you guys did, I mean, all of you could do those monologues when you're auditioning for something yeah, and you would knock it out of the park, mm -hmm. you know, because it has such a, a freshness, but it's so the relatability, you know, from New York is True. so strong. And there's an Irish town and it's yeah. a Caribbean town. Yeah. Um, but and now let's come um, to Anthony. Anthony is one of the great translators, actually, uh, uh, living translators uh, from <laughs> Italian into America. Um, Still alive. Uh, 
Um, so uh, uh, how uh, what was it for you? And it's still an ongoing, still a draft. Yeah, um, it's still a draft. It's still ongoing. We are in the middle. It's also a work in progress. How was it for you to uh, translate uh, a Taurus, someone who in a way is now even more recognized as a unique, important figure? And um, how, how did you deal with this? Well, translating is a strange and it's like being a professional contortionist. Um, it's, a, it's an odd pursuit. I, <coughs> I love words. And this is going to seem strange, but I don't really care what they mean. I love them for themselves. And I think Mattia Torre had some of this. Okay, not. Obviously, he had a lot of things to say. But he was deeply, if, if I understand anything from what I read, and uh, I think I do, he loved, loved words. Um, translation is, a, is a, again, I'm going to use the word strange again, but there is a str an uncanny quality, an almost verging on the magical quality of what happens when you translate. I've been doing it a long time. I've been doing it for most of my life. And it's almost incantatory. Um, and when I read Mattia Torre, I could feel it coming clear. It was just he had a, a, a you know, he has a, some kind of strength that he puts into the words. Um, some time ago, I wrote an essay about translation. I came up with a line that I was really happy with, which is that there is no such thing as an untranslatable word. The famous thing in translation is, is anything untranslatable? No, you might need an entire volume to translate that one word, but mm. it's translatable. But there are untranslatable worlds. Mm. And this is the very difficult thing about Rome. Rome is a city where every courtyard is a stage and where every walk down the street is a performance. I mean, it's also true of Naples. It's very true of the South. The North tends to be much more... Um, mm, Button Calvinistic, down. huh? Yeah, button down. A little button down. Um, though, you know, you get to um, know that. But um, but there are words like portone. Take the word portone. I say the word portone. It means what? Street door. It's, you know, the, the door. But it means so much more. You walk through. There's a garden in there. The kids are playing. All the people are shouting down from the... There's a, there's a portinaio who's got a little house there. And then the amount of life that passes yeah. through that door as opposed to a door yeah, yeah. in some other place it's almost yeah. a narnia type situation mm -hmm. or you take giro one of my favorites which is the same eight couples get together for dinner every third thursday of every two <laughs> months and when the bill comes one of them takes out his wallet and says no this is mine and pays for it and then the next time they get together the person to his left acts out the same Theme. And in the end, they might as well have said, you had the cucumber sandwich, and you, and it'd be the same amount of money, money, but it's just theater. So all of this was very, very much in the air. And so you can imagine the feeling that I got when after having sat at my little typewriter and sent off the text, and I got to see the words get up and become people. Mm -hmm. So it was a deeply moving thing. It was what, was, what was complicated? What surprised you? Well, the first thing is you've got to figure out what's weird and what's normal. Well, I mean, in this, by Torb, in his, in his work. That's yeah. what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had some of the same thing with Paolo Sorrentino. I translated um, a book and two series of his and uh, Luca Guadagnino. And it's like, exactly where is, you know, the center of gravity? Because Sorrentino does some very strange stuff. But it's normal. That is, so one of the, one of the, it's like those plimsoll lines on the side of a ship, right? Mm. How deep in the water is that ship? Mm -mm. And how deep should it be? Mm. So you see an actor like Mattia Torre, he comes along, he says, Ooh, giru. <laughs> and you're like going, proper restaurant etiquette for eating dormouse, leave the teeth. Okay. <laughs> 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 and and there's but there's a fair amount of this. You're trying to gauge what is normal and what is not. Now, I was lucky enough to learn Italian before I turned 21. And I learned it in various places. 
between Lecce and Perugia and Cuneo. So this is the south, the center, and the north. And so I feel like I got a good dusting of it. And a lot of translators, you realize when you see what they're what they're doing in English, you can you can understand they don't quite know where they are. Mm. And Mattia Torre, he it was hard to gauge, but then there was also like he left crumbs. It was he made it clear you could follow his was this he was giving cues and so i was deeply grateful to him it's uh, interesting how much goes one way and weirdly the other when you translate mm -hmm. i don't know if any of that was useful that was highly useful i think it's a great great reminder and it's, it sounds easy what do you say it's so complicated you know, I have a what, question. Um, let me let me just get to Valeria um, um, first. Uh, uh, Valeria, it's the fourth playwright. It's the fourth playwright edition, and um, Tom Stoppard. It just came up another evening. He famously said, "When you go through airport security, you say, no, I have nothing to declare.' And then they s go through and they say, "Actually, there's something there." So, oh yeah, I forgot. You know, and he said, this "Plays and theater book often is about this. There's something invisible, something inside." What do you think is not fully declared? What's in there that would raise the detector? What is, do you think is in his work, that yeah. in, in Torres' work? And for America, you live between two worlds. What would resonate or what does resonate? Oh, I have another goal. So I have the goal to bring uh, what is understandable, what is uh, common. I have a goal uh, with my project, uh, my project, uh, my my artist project <laughs> uh, to um, to bring uh, understandable what uh, is uh, important in Italy, and so of course uh, you have uh, to be to be straight to, and uh, to tradire. Mm -hmm. Ah, you have to betray. Uh, try. Uh, you have to betray, and uh, you have to be loyal. Faithful, yeah. So uh, is a is a strange thing, but. Uh, um, when uh, I start with the desire to uh, dedicate an entire biennial to Mattia Torre, and uh, <laughs> Julia knows because uh, I pop up uh, out of the blue and say, I want to do that. <laughs> and, I say, mm. and I was thinking, oh, maybe she will uh, answer me, okay, thank you very much. But uh, maybe it's not interesting for us, no? But uh, at the same time, I was so, so determined. But why? What's because, in there? Uh, What's in there? Yeah, because uh, I knew the first play I read very well was Perfetta. And Mattia Torre was so, uh, so deeply inside the life of the woman. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is so strange because I don't like. Uh, a man who talk about, about women usually. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I have a lot of uh, preconceptions, you know. <laughs> so uh, the life of a woman must be told by a woman, I guess. Mm. But when I read uh, Perfetta, I say, oh, this is uh, very, very uh, loyal to my soul. And I was so curious to see the reading in English, because mm -hmm. I was so curious. That it was the first uh, question I, I, I asked uh, to Kisha what, was, uh, what did you feel about this play? Because uh, it's so universal. And so this is the goal of our project, to, to talk about universal plays, uh, not Italian, uh, not uh, uh, German, or just the uh, plays. This was uh, our uh, our goal from the very first day. So, of course, Italian, because I'm Italian, so normal. <laughs> <laughs> Short cut, before we come yeah, to your yeah. question. Yeah, yeah I, I want to say something more about, about this concept. I think that uh, Mattia Torre find a way to talk about, you know, uh, uh, present life, but in a very universal way. Even when it's so local, is start to be universal. For example, the obsession of fo for food. It's so Roman, but it's so from Napoli or Sicily or from every Southern culture, can be Greece, can be mm. Spain or Hispanic. Mm. And uh, it's because it was a, a, he, he was a great observer, that's why. 
And he find, but not only this, he find a way to make it universal because this language is full of invention, I think. For example, in four, five, six, there's an invention that for me is uh, incredible. When he start to talk about uh, the um, grandmother tomato sauce, like uh, the, the eternal flame, it become a, mm -hmm. an eternal tomato <laughs> sauce because people, you know, the, 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 the son and the grandson continue to, uh, to, to do, do the same, same, to cook the same, you know, tomato sauce. And it was so, you know, uh, talking about, uh, you know, um, the family and how the family can be a cage just in one word that it's a, a, a big laugh, make you, make you laugh. And this is so extraordinary because uh, it's a deep observation of, the, of our relationship, it's universal, and even it's a, 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 an invention in the language. I want to remember that uh, uh, Mattia Torre start from independent theater, then suddenly uh, everybody understand it was so incredibly, an amazing writing, so uh, he start to work for television, for from uh, the mainstream, but even when he, got, uh, he started to work in the television, he continued to experiment. For example, I remember a very short series that he, he did in, uh, in television. It's about two bouncers. You say bouncer? Mm -hmm. The people yeah. on clubs? No? Yeah. Yeah, yeah Buttafori. They were, you know, just talking about uh, grotesque uh, episodes or talking about philosophy just in front of these people going inside a club and going <laughs> uh, out of there. And it was amazing. It's something like a, a, a piece of uh, Teatro dell'Absurd. La, de no, it, it sounds like Beckett, but in a very Roman way, just <laughs> in front of this club with two bouncers talking about very crazy and grotesque stuff. Mm -hmm. And this is so new in our television because our television is so traditional and it works because it's in, invented a language that it's not normal because it's an invention, but universal. Not universal. Good. So, Beckett bouncer, here you go. So <laughs> my question is perfectly coming behind you, and you are who I wanted to ask. Um, what, what was Matteo Torre's lineage, like theatrical lineage? Was he uh, in the tradition of Dario Fo? Um, is it Pirandello? Like, w w you know, what was he carrying? Hmm. Wow. Yeah, I, that's a question. Um, I'm not sure about that because I never talked with him about this, but we talk about theater, of course. Mm -hmm couple of times and uh, I think that uh, he's in uh, you know the, 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 the lineage of of course it's more Dario Fo than Pirandello I mean there's a, a lineage uh, we say that in literature even in theater we are like two strong tradition in Italy one is the drama the other one is the comedy the mm -hmm. comedy uh, is the one that try to make a, an upside down of the reality mm -hmm. you know it's like Pinocchio is like Dario Fo, of course. And Mattia Torre is on this line because he finds a way to talk, to talk about our present and even about drama. For example, there's one of the last uh, works uh, uh, he did in television is uh, La Linea Verticale. He talked about uh, uh, cancer uh, and he, he was already sick at the time. And uh, it's so funny, but you can cry also. And uh, it's always, even in the drama, you find a way to make, to make upside down the reality to see what is behind. And it's the line of... Uh, of but the this, absurdist, this absurdist strain goes through all of his work? Uh, the mo mostly, yeah. Yeah, mostly. Mm. So let's uh, open it up a little bit over time already. Uh, and we have Panettone, right? Yes. It's uh, behind the gray doors, uh, It's not, if it's still there. Um, so we open it up. Uh, maybe, Tomek, if we can have uh, some light. And thank you for, for your work up there. So an observation, a question. Uh, now you have a chance to say something that in two hours you can't, and maybe never again uh, in your life. <laughs> come over and since we are recording is this better to the mic maybe introduce yourself very shortly hi i'm dario nice to meet you all and thanks for the performance today uh i just wanted to ask a question that's a uh, 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 topic that has been touched uh, about how you actually get something that's so typical uh translated and acted uh, in another language 
and it's between direction, tra translation direction and interpretation. Uh, it's, uh, uh, given the fact that when you translate, it's not the best way to, for example, translate a dialect into a local dialect, but do you think that there's uh, uh, some kind of attitudes that are similar uh, in uh, different uh, cultures uh, that can be used as a hook for the actors uh, in particular to not to get the sound of something but more the attitude uh, something that's for example in this co in this case something that's close to the roman attitude but you can find it here in the us hmm. well i think it's for all of us and i think robert <laughs> i i give you robert <laughs> Um, but I also, okay, so there's a lighthearted and not terrifically on topic response to this, but it's something I've been thinking about, which is, yes, Naples, New York. There is a lineage that is not obvious, um, which is that many thousands of years ago, Greeks sailed west in search of a new land, mm -hmm. and they found it. And it was called Naples. Mm -hmm. And you know how Neapolitan ice cream is written weird? That's because it's Neapolis, the new city. And it's on a, lat a latitude, line of latitude. You'd be very surprised at. It's the exact mm -hmm. same as New York City. Yeah. And then every couple thousand years, they sail further west and find a new city and call it New City. OK, that wasn't the Italians who named New York City. But it was Neapolitans who came here. So there's going to be a through line in so many ways. Um, it's so hard. It's an impalpable thing of what exactly. Certainly when I saw these people, these great uh, you know, interpreters, bringing it into the three dimensions from the two dimensions of language, it was like there was a secret message encoded in there that they understood. Mm -hmm which was encoded in the language that I got from Mattia. So there's a passaparola, there's a, a <laughs> just a direct <laughs> handoff that is like a moment, you know, it's not, not stated, it's tacit, but it's there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, maybe we should ask actors about it. Robert, what did you? Well, I, I think that the, uh, um, uh, something cuts through uh, the, the, what, it, what is it about? And I was amazed by Skyler and Stephen Keisha, especially, that it, uh, the the sort of say the translation it didn't matter because what it had to say cuts through to the heart, which is everything. You know, Brando once said that anyone could have did uh, I could have been a contender because people all could relate to I could have been somebody. You know what I'm saying? So that that travels universally with Shakespeare and many, many playwrights, Tennessee Williams, who does a good female, <laughs> female inter interpretation my, my, in my book. So that's what I think, that the translation, it doesn't, yes, we might lose it in the Roman sense of the, and you recognize it more, but we recognize what it's about and what it says. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was gonna say the connection that I found and what I shared with uh, Stella you know, people sometimes say to me, oh, you're just so perfect. Or even, you know, social media, everyone just looks so perfect. But I, I, I think if you just knew the war that was going on inside of me on a daily basis, you know, um, you would just be like, oh, wow. You know, so I think that, like you said, that for me was the way I connected to this piece that, you know, perfect on the outside, but you just don't know what's really going on, you know, underneath. So, yeah. I and, think and how like many it, people say that Woody Allen films are impossible to watch outside New York if you don't grow up here. You yeah. would never understand right. it. And As a matter true. of fact, yeah. for me, it's been very easy with uh, Perfetta, with Kisha, because um, as Valeria <laughs> said, it's so universal. So what, when we were going through the, the, the script, it was like, I, I don't have to add more. Like It's exactly like the metaphor of the plane trees, which I didn't even notice before, I didn't know about that, mm. that they need to be by themselves. Mm. So if, as this woman right now needs a break, but no one is giving her a break in the metaphor, and if you go and you drive through, through Lungo Tevere, and you see all these three, and you, <laughs> you feel it. So of course she, she gets the message of wanting to be left alone and don't suffer, but if you are not from Rome, and if you didn't drive through those roads, 
and if you didn't get stuck in the traffic on Lungo de Ere, um, before yeah. taking the bridge at Castel Sant'Angelo. So I think you can, um, you sh as in translation, yeah, you give up something to find something else. Because yes, with the with the job that we did, I didn't even think about the plane trees. So it's a fact. Maybe two more questions. You had one. I just want to say one, yeah. oh. one mm -hmm. throw in one thing, just from the translator's point of view. <coughs> You've got people coming back from Vietnam on a plane, and then you have a tree that's a plane. That was a problem. <laughs> <laughs> that's why they were never planes. They were always plane trees, and the plane was an aircraft. <laughs> Because you got to say, Bill, to you over there and you over there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we don't talk about plane trees very much in America. No. Right. Yeah, yeah. A so plane, it, a it plane translation. An uncomfortable little linguistic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, mine is not, uh, my name is Alessandro. I grew up in Rome. I was lucky enough to actually be exposed to Mattia Torres' work, early work, uh, before I moved to New York. So what I find interesting being here tonight, first off, it's amazing to now see this kind of boomerang of like words coming back uh, in a different form, but they come from the same source. So thank you for all your work. Uh, it was really amazing. Um, interestingly, uh, though, I find that all this conversation about what is so Roman about it, what is so universal about it, I feel like in my mind, there's something um, I think Interestingly, for a, an American audience, which I don't know how many Americans are here tonight, mm -hmm. we're, we're hearing the word of a Roman uh, um, uh, uh, author that almost um, plays a little cruel joke in not telling us much about Rome. Like the the best that we heard is I, it was probably the Raccordo Anulare, the translation of the Beltway, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a one moment that we heard something that has to do with the city. Uh, I think that where Mattia Torres zooms in and it pinches somebody in a moment, that's where it becomes universal, universal because there's a level of frustration of a sense of like, it's everybody against me that we all have experienced wherever we grew up. What I find to be very Roman about it, and I love it, and that's the, way I, that's the reason why I left, <laughs> is that sense that if you're in Rome, and maybe it's Italian, is like, these are the cards, these are the cards that you were dealt and there is this sense of not being able to escape that. Mm. So you focus on what makes you mad, what makes you frustrated. Mm. You dream of like picking up that gun and shooting everybody. Mm -hmm. Of course, you never do it, and and you just like leave there like steaming, like and and you know as if you're like cooking your own so sauce of your own guts mm. in this world that you can't survive in, but somehow you are still in and you just can't leave. Uh, there's something painful and, and there's like, like you feel like you're gaining merit and credit because yeah. you're surviving this and you just can't get away from it. It sounds like New York. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one more question, someone, uh, or an observation, yeah. Good. So first of all, thank you very much it was really touching to see i mean to see and to hear matia torres words uh, just across the the ocean he, he he would have been so so happy about this and i'm kind of you know and um i totally agree with you and with uh, graziano speaking about the fact that there is a strange connection and strong connection i would say the same that uh, we can speak about with Lucia Calamaro between theater and literature. And I think that's the secret with Mattia Torre. He used to say that it was too literary for theater and too theatrical for literature. Mm -hmm. And I tried so many times to say here, okay, let's write a novel. And he was too lazy to do this. Uh, and uh, <laughs> yeah, totally. He was uh, really a last minute man delivering, for example, Perfetta. Um, Yes, he had like six months to write the piece, uh, and the very last day he just gave the piece <laughs> to Jackie Gucciari. <laughs> and the actress was like going crazy. <laughs> and when I say to him, uh, well, he's her, actually, is her piece, uh, and he said, no, it's my piece, <laughs> so it, she's gonna wait. Uh, and, it, and it was perfect, actually. The, the piece, the piece, it was perfect. So, uh, yes, thank you all, it was very, it was great. Thank you. Thank you.
Any, uh, any last words, something you felt you couldn't say? Um, I want to just uh, say the, the last thing. Uh, there is a, a little emotional. Uh, so uh, I was uh, close to give up, you know. I did not. Know. Yeah, you know, I, I was close uh, to giving up uh, and because I was very tired after the pandemic. I was uh, not motivated to continue this project. And, uh, and uh, I want to thank you all of us, because you supported me very, very much. <laughs> thank you. I want to say thank you to Anthony for the translation and to the actors and the actors for the interpretation, because uh, I, I recognize, you know, in English, the, 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 this, this scene, and I can see in the audience the same vibes that I saw in the Italian version. So I think it's a strong work, so thank you. Very much. <laughs> So just a little thing. So this is just the start. We have two years to work on it, on this place to translate the whole place, to read the whole so place. We work and we work. Hope around the USA. So and we will publish it, right? The and then uh, to yeah. publish maybe with a uh, who knows. Yeah. And uh, so. So I just want to follow up on what Robert said so beautifully about uh, could have been great, could have been a contender, which, okay, that's Brooklyn, and then we're talking about it here. <laughs> um, which is the um, lead singer of the Pogues who wrote the song Just Died. Yeah, and Shane. in it, begin Shane McGowan, and he uh, said, you know, it was Christmas Eve, made it a fairy tale of New York. Mm -hmm. And in the back and forth between him and the great, late lead singer, Kirstie. Uh, Kirstie McCall, and said, I could have been someone. And she says, yes, yeah, so could anyone. Right, right. <laughs> it's nothing special. And okay. that's New York, too. <laughs> that's New York, too. And it doesn't matter. Even if you are, it does not matter so much. Okay, so yeah. thank you all. And I hope you will stay here for our little reception. Thank you all for coming. Thanks to HowlRound for screaming. Tomek uh, at the uh, board and um, everybody to make it happen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. oh, great.